Thank you for joining us on Synthesis Workshop. Today is a Research Spotlight episode, which has been made possible through a partnership with Thema Chemistry, aimed at showcasing some of the work of Thema Chemistry Journal awardees. On today's episode, we have with us Dr. David Nelson, who's joining us from Scotland. David earned his Master's in Chemistry from the University of Edinburgh in 2008, after which he completed his doctoral work in the group of Professor Jonathan Percy at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow. The theme of his doctoral work was reaction mechanisms and structure activity relationships in ring-closing metathesis reactions. He subsequently worked under the supervision of Professor Stephen Nolan at the University of St. Andrews, and in 2014 he came back to the University of Strathclyde, where he's currently a senior lecturer. And from there, I'll let you get started, David. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation to share some of our research with you today. This presentation covers some of our recent work to compare the behaviour of nickel and palladium catalysis when cross-coupling functionalised substrates. The experimental work for this was primarily carried out by Dr Alistair Cooper. His PhD was funded by Syngenta and we were fortunate to be able to work with Dr Paul Burton, who is a team leader at their Gillette Hill site in Berkshire. As many of you will be aware, the field of nickel catalysis is developing very rapidly, with new reactions being reported regularly. However, our focus has been on developing a detailed understanding of the underlying reaction mechanisms and structure reactivity relationships that are involved. In this respect, nickel catalysis is considerably more complicated than palladium catalysis, and some key points are summarised on this slide. In terms of available oxidation states, nickel does not simply proceed via nickel zero and or nickel two intermediates. Nickel one is regularly invoked in catalysis, as is nickel three, while nickel four species can be accessed using a sufficiently strong oxidant. Some systems behave rather straightforwardly, while others can switch behaviour depending on the ligand or substrate structure. And there are three examples of this on the right hand side of this slide. Tetracus triethylphosphine nickel zero can undergo oxidative addition to form nickel two or halide abstraction to form nickel one. The partitioning between these pathways depends on the identity of the halide. In the case of bis NHC nickel zero complexes, Larger NHC ligands promote halide abstraction, while smaller ligands promote oxidative addition. Finally, we have the example of nickel cod DPPF, which we and others have used extensively, which forms nickel 1, but through a comproportionation route rather than directly by halide abstraction. So the take home message here is that nickel catalysis can feature some complexity, but this does make it a very interesting area to study. If you're interested in the reactions of nickel zero with organohalides, there's a reference at the bottom of the slide to a review that's been written by my team. So in this work, we were interested in finding out how different functional groups can coordinate to nickel zero. This has been studied quite widely, and this slide is by no means a complete list of such studies, but we do have some selected examples that include reported single crystal X-ray diffraction data. Koche showed that benzophenone will displace phosphine ligands from tetracus triethylphosphine nickel zero in order to form an eta-2 complex. Kenopole has isolated a thiophene eta-2 complex and Johnson has prepared this anthracene complex. I'd recommend that anyone interested in this area also reads the 2019 paper by Lovin Kenopole, which goes into some detail about the structure and stability of bisphosphine nickel zero eta-2 complexes. Finally, the references at the bottom are for some work by van der Boom and colleagues on the role of alkene coordination to palladium and to nickel in determining oxidative addition selectivity. So overall, we can see that nickel will coordinate to quite a wide range of functional groups, and we want to understand what this might mean for synthetic organic chemistry and catalysis. Around the time that we published our 2020 synthesis paper on which this presentation is based, we also published a manuscript examining the specific case of aldehydes and ketones. There's not really time in this presentation to go into a lot of detail about that study, but the reference is given at the bottom of this slide. In brief, we noted that aryl halides with aldehyde or ketone functional groups underwent anomalously fast reactions with nickel cod DPPF. In some cases, these were even faster than the reactions of aryl bromides. There are some examples of rate constants on the left hand side. In catalysis, this allowed us to achieve site-selective reactions, albeit with relatively low yields, although we do hope to go back to this and try to optimise these reactions a little more. 
Finally, in our previous study, computational work allowed us to characterise the ring walking process. And this showed that for aldehydes in purple and ketones in red, the nickel centre can walk across the ring without releasing the substrate. This then brings the nickel to the aryl halide site ready for oxidative addition. So in this study, we wanted to find a robust and quantitative way to compare the behaviour of palladium and nickel. Obviously, palladium is still king for most cross-coupling reactions, and so it's often going to be the benchmark that nickel catalysis will be judged against. We initially wanted to compare the selectivity of competition reactions between two substrates. In each case, one substrate is always bromobenzene, and this serves as our benchmark substrate. In this set of experiments, we have aryl halides with a variety of functional groups, here labelled as Y, that will compete with bromobenzene for a limited amount of toluyl boronic acid. And we selected this boronic acid rather than simply phenyl boronic acid so that homocoupling side reactions didn't then confuse the analysis. We used two catalysts for this study. One is a DPPF nickel 2 complex on the left, and the other is a DPPF palladium 2 complex on the right. These experiments were analysed by GCFID, so this means we can simply stop each reaction at a known mass of our internal standard, and then we can take and filter a sample for analysis. We did every reaction in duplicate. So we might then expect to see a trend as shown in the sketch at the bottom of the slide, in which electron deficient substrates undergo cross-coupling in preference to bromobenzene. And this is certainly what we would expect for palladium based on the established literature. And just a final note on selectivity, we define this as the concentration of B, which is our functionalized product, minus the concentration of A, which is the product of bromobenzene cross-coupling, divided by the total conversion. So we therefore expect positive numbers if the substituted aryl bromide undergoes cross-coupling preferentially, and negative numbers if bromobenzene cross-coupling is preferred. We can then look at the results for nickel and palladium in turn. If we look at nickel catalysis first, we can see that substrates that don't have a coordinating functional group appear to lie mostly on a flat line. These points are all in blue. Note that each individual experiment is plotted so that there are two points for each functional group. This data suggests that electronic effects alone aren't a strong determinant of the reaction selectivity. If we then add the points for coordinating functional groups, which are in green, we can see that this supports the notion that functional group coordination affects reaction selectivity. Nitrile, sulfoxide, imine, ketone, aldehyde, alkyne and alkene functional groups all enable selective cross-coupling. Even though these cover a range of electronic character, that goes from essentially neutral to very electron poor. For palladium, the story is rather different. The non-coordinating substrates, here in blue, all lie on a line with a positive gradient, which is what we would expect. Electron deficient substrates tend to undergo faster oxidative addition to palladium. When we then add in the green points for coordinating functional groups, there's not really a particularly strong effect. These do tend to lie in the top half of the plot, but there certainly isn't the same pronounced effect that we see for nickel. So these data, and the data on the previous slide, suggest that the coordination of functional groups to nickel has a pronounced effect on reaction selectivity, but that this doesn't then extend to palladium. So the flip side of coordination to substrates is the potential for this to have an adverse effect on the reaction turnover by allowing the formation of low energy off-cycle complexes. We wanted to investigate this in detail so we turn to Glorius' robustness screening approach, which is briefly explained here, although full details can be found in the reference at the bottom of the slide. We first perform a reaction of interest, which in our case is a suzuki miura cross-coupling reaction, and then we record the yield of our uninhibited reaction. We then repeat this reaction, dosing a different additive each time, and we can record two key pieces of information. Firstly, we can record the yield. If the additive brings about a decrease in the yield, then this can be evidence for the additive interacting with the catalyst. Where possible, we can also measure the amount of the additive remaining. If the additive itself is consumed, then this may be undergoing a reaction. For example, if we added an aryl iodide to this suzuki miura cross-coupling reaction. If the additive is not consumed, then it may be evidence for reversible interaction with the catalyst. We're going to focus here on yield changes. There's quite a lot of information on this slide, but I'll work through it bit by bit. Before I do, I just want to note the reaction that we studied. 
Here, we took a relatively simple substituted RL bromide and we performed a Suzuki Miura cross coupling reaction under these rather standard conditions. We did this three times once with 5 mole percent of palladium, once with 1 mole percent of palladium, and once with 5 mole percent of nickel. In each case, we can record the conversion to the product by GCFID, which is 94%, 96%, and 89%, respectively. The data presented in the bottom half of the slide is for the reactions that are repeated with additives. The structures are the additives that were used, so 18 in total. The additives cover a range of structures. We have anilines, ethers, amines, aldehydes, ketones, sulfides, sulfoxides, sulfones, alkynes, amides, esters, alkenes, and nitriles. We did include nitrobenzene here because it's well known that nickel zero doesn't tolerate nitro groups. The yields are colour coded. Black yields are close to the baseline yield with their additive while yellow numbers represent a decrease in yield and red numbers represent less than 20% conversion to the product. The reactions with palladium, even at 1 mole percent loading, perform very well and rarely show a decrease in yield of more than about 10%. The only exception is the reaction in the presence of phenylacetylene. In contrast, the reactions catalyzed by nickel show quite a range of yields. In most cases, there's a slight decrease in yield but in particular, imines, sulfides and terminal alkynes decrease the yield to below 15%. So these data are consistent with what was seen in the previous data set. Palladium is relatively insensitive to functional groups, while nickel is very sensitive to the functional groups that are present in the reaction. Finally, we carried out some computational studies to examine these coordination effects with palladium and nickel. Details of the level of theory that was used are at the bottom of the slide, and of course further details can be found in the paper. For each of 10 representative functional groups, we located intermediate A, which is the eta-2 complex preceding oxidative addition, the oxidative addition transition states, and the oxidative addition product. For functional groups that might coordinate to the metal centre, we also located structures for this coordination. So the table in this slide records the energies of the complex in which the functional group is coordinated to the metal with respect to the pre-oxidative addition eta-2 complex. Negative numbers mean that the coordination of the functional group is more favourable than arene eta-2 coordination, and these values are underlined. Nickel will coordinate more favourably to eight of the functional groups than it will to the arene, all except amide and ester functional groups. In contrast, the calculations suggest that palladium should only favourably coordinate to the imines, alkynes and alkenes, and this coordination is significantly less favourable for palladium than it is for nickel. The graph on this slide plots the transition state energy versus the substituent constant sigma. These plots show the same gradient for palladium and nickel, with a value of approximately minus 4, although the absolute energy of the transition state in each case is lower for nickel. There are some take home messages from this study which I hope will be useful, not just to those of you who study nickel catalysis, but for those who might hope to apply it in their own research. Palladium catalysis selectivity is largely, if not completely, dominated by electronic effects. In contrast, nickel catalysis is insensitive to electronic effects, but coordinating functional groups can bring about significant levels of selectivity. However, and for related reasons, the yields of palladium catalyzed Suzuki Miura cross coupling reactions are much less sensitive to additives, even when the loading is dropped to 1 mole percent. Most nickel catalyzed reactions with additives saw some decrease in yield, and in some cases the yield dropped below 20%. And finally, DFT calculations show the same trend in oxidative addition transition state energies for palladium and for nickel, albeit with the absolute values being lower for nickel. Nickel will also more favorably bind functional groups. Thank you for watching this Research Spotlight episode, and thank you to David for explaining some of the differences between palladium and nickel in catalysis. Thank you as well to Team of Chemistry for making this episode possible. If you enjoyed the episode, you can support us by subscribing and telling your peers about this podcast, and feel free to send us any questions or comments you have. Follow us on Twitter to stay up to date, and see you all next time.